Welcome to Award-Winning Photography Explained. This is a channel where we invite award-winning photographers and take a deep dive into how they created the image that won them the award. Today we have a very special person with us. Bruce is a portrait family pet and commercial photographer, including light painting based in Winnipeg, Manitoba. He's been the Provincial Photographer of the Year four times and a finalist ten times for PPOC Professional Photographers of Canada. He's one of three people in history who has ever received both the two highest honors in Canadian photography, the Fellowship and the Yusuf Krash Lifetime Achievement Award for Photography Excellence and the only Canadian to receive three separate fellowships. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you for having me. So, um, Bruce, tell us about yourself. Tell us about the man behind the images that you create. I know you have won a, um, a, a slew of awards and um, I will put a link uh, to all the awards that you have won in the show notes. But tell us about the person who is behind these images and how he got interested in photography. Well, it, it really started in high school, um, or actually even before that. I, um, I, I couldn't see myself, uh, even though I was a decent student, I, I just couldn't see myself going on and uh, going to university and becoming a, um, uh, uh, I mean, a, a lawyer, I think I would be good because I'm a talker, but uh, I couldn't see myself sitting at a desk all day doing the same thing day after day, or uh, if I went into a uh, production line somewhere, um, you know, putting rivets into these four holes eight hours a day. Um, I decided that uh, I took a vocational um, option through high school and the first two months you actually go through four different stations there's photography commercial art graphic art and drafting and uh, it, it came down to I had an interest in either photography or drafting and but going back to that same thinking I said well if I was going to be drafting I'd be sitting at a desk all day in photography, everything is different. Uh, one day I might be in the studio, the next day on location. I'm dealing with different people, different subjects, different challenges. Uh, so I jumped into photography. I, as a student member, uh, I guess I was 17, uh, I started apprenticing with another photographer. I, I joined the Professional Photographers of Canada as a student member as well. I've basically dedicated my life to photography. Uh, outside of that, uh, I'm a big animal lover. I've had cats for you know 30 years. Uh, currently, I have one who uh, is great but uh, loves to shed a lot. So we'll, <laughs> I have to deal with wearing white a lot because she's a white cat. Um, I, I love uh, joke around. I have a great sense of humor. I'm close with my friends and my dad. Um, well, I'm just just sort of average guy basically. Well, the image that we're going to talk about today, the Black Knight, and we'll show that in a bit, got an image excellence level at the PPA, which is Professional Photographers of America, and helped Bruce qualify for the PPA master's degree. Now, I know we've had a number of photographers here and we've talked about PPOC, which is an amazing organization and how they benefited for, from it. You're one of the first that I'm interviewing who um, is a member of both. You know, you're based in Manitoba. You're a member of PPA as well as PPOC. Tell us, being a, a Canadian photographer, how does it benefit uh, you or a Canadian photographer to be a member of PPA as well as PPOC? Well, I, I do believe that you should, wherever you are in the world, you should be a member of your, your own nation's organization to begin with. But outside of that, uh, really PPA is the big, uh, big dog on the block. They have 37,000 members international. There's a str they're the strongest organization. Um, they have tremendous resources 
for their members. Uh, everything from education on photography to business sense, uh, they continue trying to help you with marketing concepts. Um, you name it, you, they have it. Um, I, I don't even take full advantage of what's available to me, and that's something I should. Uh, they have an amazing magazine. Um, it's, it's just, they are, um, again, they're also a nonprofit organization. I really do believe in um, sticking with nonprofit organizations because they're in it for the right reasons rather than making uh, an owner uh, a profit. Um, but of course you have to do business right, uh, especially nowadays. Uh, and, and PPA has really got their business sense in their house in order. And they, they're continuing to be able to give back and give to their members as far as education. So what it gives me specifically, uh, it gives me a different slant on, on my education. Uh, I get Canadian and and um, uh, other other speakers, of course, that are that are not from Canada. I get that education, but I also get uh, uh, a style and a sense of what's popular in the states, and I, that helps me blend uh, my two styles together. Um, education there, there's so many excellent photographers in the states just because of the numbers of population. Uh, and again, I said they're in a, they're the most international organization. So it, I really get the best of both worlds. Uh, I would strongly advise any member, any any photographer, wherever you are in the world, uh, join your local uh, country's organization. I think that's important to have local access. But PPA is uh, is an amazing source that can help anybody. Uh, business, photographic, um, um, education, even uh, just the, the littlest things. And just like any association, when you, when you know that you're a member, you can call somebody up and say, hey, um, I'm having a problem with this and you're, you, you do this. Would you be able to answer a question or two for me? Um, just like most people, they're going to be, most of the time they're going to be willing. Um, there's always the odd person when it, wherever you go that may say no, but um, perfect example is I've just started uh, getting a, a closer friendship with, a, uh, with an amazing photographer out of, out of Oregon uh, That's that through another association I belong to, the American Society of Photographers. Um, you have to be a PPA degree recipient to be a member of that association. And... Um, you know, I'm I'm getting amazing business ideas from from one member. Uh, there's another member that I'm I'm helping out on their lighting and their uh, uh, their photography in general, posing lighting, basic concepts. So it's it's um, the photographic community is is really bent on helping each other uh, in in organizations. That's the one thing I found that people outside of organizations they tend to stick to themselves and give themselves as an island. And they don't realize, they don't want to share any ideas and they don't want to ask for, for fear of either looking like they don't know or um, giving a competitor an edge of some sort. But really, inside the organizations, um, we're there to help each other. And, and I believe um, you, mentor, you yourself mentor a number of people here in a local PPOC and as well as collaborate with a lot of members across the country, right? Yeah, over the years, I've uh, certainly uh, helped out certain uh, certain members locally or across the country. Uh, I routinely, I'm a national judge, so I routinely get people, you know, sending me inf images to critique them and and uh, give some suggestions. I've done that um, with with people internationally as well through the internet. So there's there's a lot of uh, opportunities out there. Wonderful. So should we uh, dive straight into the image? Uh, you Absolutely. want to bring up your uh, screen? So uh, sure. The image. You know what? I, I'm, I'm going to show you a video first. Um, okay. This is, uh, we're, we're talking about light painting today. And light painting, there's two, two uh, theories of light painting. There's uh, a really in-depth version, and then there's uh, a light version, as I call it. Um, 
that's that's the easy way um i'm a person who believes in the more in-depth aspect uh when i'm when i'm photographing a subject um the final piece may end up being 40 50 60 plus images um where the easy way of doing it is it might only be say one to five images that they're used um and this video will show it's only 42 seconds long but it'll show you uh, a little idea of the making of what we are talking about all right so this is a 42 second video i'll quickly show you and this is sort of the making um of this entire image and then we'll go into uh the the hard part in, in a minute So that was a quick 42 second video of the whole process. However, that whole session probably took three to four hours. It's, uh, it's quite a labor intensive aspect. What inspired you to, um, to do this, uh, the Black Knight? And what was, um, how did you conceive of the concept? Well, I uh, fell in love with light painting uh, probably about six or seven years ago. Uh, it was definitely uh, something on my radar that I wanted to learn and uh, try to master. Um, the, the plan actually was to, uh, to take some courses uh, on, in the fall of 2020, but of course we ran into a uh, pandemic. However, I was still able to take uh, some classes uh, virtually, and uh, then I had spent uh, all of uh, 2021, um, the winter part of 2021, learning. Uh, then I started um, physically trying to build up my portfolio and actually creating pieces. Uh, so I, this was actually the very first motorcycle that I, I had ever photographed. Uh, or first one I ever light painted. Uh, this was done as a portfolio piece. Um, however, I, I pulled a, I put a sort of a uh, Cool Bikes Wanted ad on a local Facebook group uh, explaining what I'm doing. I think I put up a video of one of the cars that I had done. And I said, I'm looking for some interesting motorcycles to, to do something like this with. And uh, certainly got a few few people that were definitely interested. Uh, this black uh, Ducati caught my eye. Um, the location that I chose actually is somewhere that I have used in the past for portraits. Yeah, even though it's in Winnipeg, it sort of gives a very much a, a New York feel to the photograph, uh, to the location. Uh, even though it was in Winnipeg, uh, this happens to be... Uh, the the support bridges of a of a train bridge and uh, right next to a uh, local baseball park uh for our uh, uh independent league team but I, i've always anytime i photograph there it it does not feel like winnipeg it, it it feels if anything more like new york so i i figured you know this is the perfect location that i wanted to use to to um to create this particular image. Now, the way light painting is done is uh, right after sunset, when there's still light in the sky, uh, you take a base image, uh, just using natural, natural light. Um, now, this is a, a variation of one of those base images that I had done. Obviously, typically I, I want to do varying exposures. So if I needed to use this base image, let's say I forgot um, because a motorcycle or a vehicle is very intricate 
let's say I, I did not get uh, a, a good exposure on a, on a specific area of the vehicle, or I had forgotten for some instance, um, I would still be able to come back and use that piece of the vehicle from a base image. But also the, the aspect of doing multiple exposures for the background in the sky. Um, if you're facing west and you have color in the sky, you could bring back that actual sky uh, into the final piece and have something uh, very creative. Now, in this case, I didn't do it. I was, I was actually facing south. Um, west is uh, beyond those buildings to the right, and I, I really wouldn't have gotten any color in the sky from this direction. So, it's definitely when you're, when you're obviously when you're photographing something black, you want to vary your exposure. Um, in this case of the base image, to make sure that in some of those deeper areas. I had uh, detail. So that's this is sort of the, the basic setup of and the location of, of where I photographed this and how the bike was set up. It's light painting is very much a uh, once you set the camera, uh, you don't touch it. Uh, I always use my uh, my base ISO in this case with a, a Nikon D850. It's 64 ISO or ISO, I guess the proper pronunciation is. Um, I particularly chose F22, um, uh, as long as the, the full vehicle is always in focus, that's, that's fine. Typically F16, F22 is what you want to use because you want a small aperture, uh, and a low ISO to, uh, to give you time to light paint and not to get detail in areas that you're not putting light on because this is really much a situation where of if I want something to be lit, I will light it um, the way I want it to. And if I don't want it lit, uh, either I won't light it or I won't bring it back into the final image. Because this is very much a, uh, a puzzle, the way this whole thing comes together. So uh, let me go into, these are some of the captures that I, I used. Um, I don't believe I... I don't believe these are all of them, but these are a lot of the main ones that I used. Um, I use a variety of light sources, LED light sources. Um, I do have one flashlight that is um, uh, incandescent bulb. But one of the, the really tricky things you need to do is you need to uh, color balance all of your, your, uh, your light sources and end up creating, uh, in my case, Lightroom or, or bridge presets that you can you can uh, balance that that flash source back to, to neutral. The last thing you want to do is use two or three or four different uh, light sources, all having a different color temperature, and then you have these the spotty look of colors uh, that are that are all over the place when you're lighting something that's one color. So that's, that's a bit of a, uh, a challenge and it's, uh, you only have to do it once, but it is a little tedious when you're first starting up, setting up your, your uh, lighting equipment. Uh, but for this particular uh, vehicle, I believe I used two, maybe three light source, uh, well, three, maybe four light sources, I should say. Uh, everything from a, uh, a little flashlight with a uh, 0.9 of an inch diameter uh, for the head to a, uh, a uh, Godox LC500 light wand. Uh, I also used a 1000 LED light panel uh, that, that was daylight balanced. And it's possible... Um, I'm trying to remember if I will find out in this shortly uh, from the uh, the shapes of the light patterns. I might have used a, a Savage Edge Mini Light, which is unfortunately no longer available. But the great thing about that particular one is it was small, handheld, uh, it was round, and they were reflected LEDs, meaning instead of pointing out towards uh, the direction of where the light is falling, the heads were pointed back into the light and were, and were reflecting off of a, uh, a back panel. So it actually gives you a softer light 
than uh, a, a, a straight directional uh, LED light source. Unfortunately, that light is no longer available. The Big Brother is still available of it. Um, it's, it's four times as large and three times as heavy. But So in this case, um, I would start off by doing using my, uh, my Godox light wand and doing overall passes from, from the entire length of the bike. Once you set the camera, you never touch it again. Everything is done by remote control. Um, I, use, uh, I use a Pluto trigger, which triggers, um, which opens and closes my camera and I have it set on bulb. So uh, it's, I, I control it off my cell phone. And once the image has been created, I use a Cam Ranger 2, which sends a uh, proprietary RAW file to, in my case, I use a, uh, an iPad on a light stand. Some people use a, a laptop, but I just find it's a little bit easier to do, uh, to have a light, to have a, a stand available and an iPad that I can move around and uh, take the stand with me close to the subject, have it slightly outside the frame, um, and be able to go back and forth quickly to it. Um, it the last thing you want to do is you don't want to touch the camera again once it's started, because ideally these pixels will line up with one another perfectly on every photograph that you do. So a solid tripod, a solid head that doesn't um, that doesn't drift. You want to lock these things down. You want to keep them <clears throat> as tight and as solid as you possibly can. Um, so I would have probably started off with, uh, well, I know I started off with some overall uh, passes on, on, of the bike from the left to the right. But what you're seeing here uh, is most of this bike, bike was actually lit with a very small flashlight and, and going in detail by detail. Uh, trying to get highlights like what you're seeing here, if you can see my um, um, my my cursor, mm -hmm. again, um, as well as this particular section of the bike, as well as the logo and the branding of the bike. Uh, little bit by little, you just start photographing every section of the bike, and you, typically you might want to do this two or three times per piece because you might be doing a slightly different angle. Um, you might get a reflection in, uh, in one image where in the next image you don't have a reflection. So all of this right now, uh, this is all done with a very small flashlight. And most of the time when you're light painting, you're moving. Uh, so you actually don't uh, show up in the photograph unless you're stationary. Now, in this case, I was stationary uh, with my body, but I was moving in with a, with a very small flashlight and lighting up these sections of the, of the bike. So you don't really see my hand moving, but because I was stationary, you, you see a ghost image of myself. Quick question before you go further. That, um, the, the, the amount of time that you um, are waving or you know the, the light you're moving around and how close how far that's all experimentation i would take it realistically yes because every light source is going to be giving you a different level of power um and the inverse square law comes into effect here so um if you double the distance you are away from the, the flash is away from the or the light source is away from the subject you lose two stops of light. So this is very much a, you have to feel it. And once you start making a couple exposures, you quickly get into, it, it falls into place. Um, you know, I need to walk this fast or I need to walk a little slower uh, or I need to have the light a little bit closer or farther from the subject. When you're doing things um, uh, like highly reflective, um, and this is something that I've started experimenting with Sunday night. Um, I, I was using a light, a very large, um, uh, the three foot round reflectors, the five in one reflectors, uh, gold, silver, black, white, uh, 
and then if you take off 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 the all the outside materials, you get a uh, translucent uh, scrim out of it. And when you're using a scrim with a light behind it, you can then um, make a larger light source, which will help um, diffuse the specularity when you're dealing with something extremely shiny. Um, in, in that particular case, I was photographing a 1939 Ford Standard Coupe, uh, and the, there's a lot of uh, weird angles on those vehicles, and I was getting um, some very strong highlights in the in the in the fenders. So what I did is I I switched over to this diffuser panel. Um, I had a uh, a, a square, I think it was a 300 uh, light LED panel that I was shining through it, and that that made the, the the specular highlight larger, and it was more it was softer and spread out. So you'll see a lot of people with some do-it-yourself modifications uh, when you when you get into light painting. Um, one of the things that I'm using here specifically uh, are some 90 degree elbows. Um, made of plastic that are cut on 45 degree angles. Uh, they're made by a gentleman called Harold Ross. Um, and when I was doing some research on light painting tools, that's, that's the only person in the world that I found that made them. He's out of the States, uh, I, I want to say New Jersey, New York area. But if you go on Etsy and you do a search on Rake the Light, that's uh, his company on, on uh, Etsy. And it'll cost you, well, in, by the time you get it to Canada, with shipping, um, conversion, and, and any duties or, or taxes, uh, probably about $150 for a couple little pieces that'll fit on, on any flashlight that has a head that's one inch diameter or smaller. But they're, they're very helpful to block the light. What you don't what you need to remember is if the camera can see the light, that means it's going to leave a, a, a light streak. And for instance, here, you'll see uh, on, the, on, on this giant streak here, the camera was, uh, my light was pointed to the camera so it could see it. So this, this obviously was, was no good. However, I could use the badging and I could also use this area here. So you have to be careful tremendously, and I, I have black gaffer tape, black duct tape. Uh, a lot of my LED lights will have a, uh, a back panel that has a lighting, and maybe it has a battery indicator, a uh, power indicator. I will black out those, those lights. Uh, the, the wand that I use by Godox, they, it comes with barn doors, but unfortunately they're not light tight. So I used a, uh, a white cardboard sheet uh, to feed it through and behind the light, uh, wrapping it over the barn doors and with black gaffer's tape, made sure that I have um, a light tight uh, backing of that, of that light source. So as long as I'm aiming it, if I'm aiming the source to my subject, I can walk right across the frame and, and you can see the back of the the light source, uh, if you were physically watching me do it, or you can what you would see me move across, but because there's no light on either me or the or the or the, the back of the light source, I'm not going to register. Neither would register on the actual uh, uh, image sensor. So you're you're very much um, the, it's it's really okay to overshoot when you're doing this type of work. Because you, you never know um, it, until you're on the computer exactly what you're going to use. You'll have a good sense when you're going through um, and you're reviewing these images after image after image on your on your iPad. But you'll have a and you'll have a really good sense of yeah okay I know I've gotten something good of this area so I can go on to the next. But your even if you have a good shot, you want to try a slightly different angle of your light source because it's going to give different highlights, different shadows. Um, in a perfect world, what you're trying to do is trying to keep a coherent uh, light direction. 
And sometimes that can be tricky because uh, if there's 60 images that are making up uh, a photograph, uh, sometimes it's physically just not possible to make sure that the light is coming from the same direction on every aspect of the, of, of the image. But like here you can see, um, even though it's, it's, it's very dark in the bottom section of the engine here, um, once you put a light on it, uh, you can get a lot of detail into the into the blacks. Now, this particular bike has a little bit more of a matte uh, black finish, which made it a lot easier actually to light paint. I, I did not necessarily pick that bike for this reason. I've actually done uh, uh, a Harley V rod that was chromed out, and so the whole bike was chrome, other than a couple small pieces. And in that case, you're dealing with the highlights and you want to make sure that the highlights are, are straight and consistent with one another. So there, there's a lot of thinking that goes into uh, when you're light painting. Uh, one of the things that I learned after this shoot is um, I carry several things in my, in my kit. Uh, one of the things I do is I carry um, a specific spray that's designed to polish wheels and uh, to give them actually a, uh, a wet look. And I found that th that looks incredible in, in photographs, uh, especially after it's lit. But, you know, you have to get go into each piece. And like in this case, you have that gold forks. And I know there was, as you can tell up here, there's a little bit of reflection. So I wouldn't have necessarily wanted to use this exposure for this area. But Little by little, you go through. Uh, here's an example that happens to show my iPad. Um, uh, the Camranger 2 is an amazing tool. Uh, a shout out to them. It's a husband and wife team out of the States. And I believe they make it in their basement. And they're phenomenal. Um, it, it allows you both to send uh, signals from your camera in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequencies um, obviously five gigahertz is a little bit faster uh, but you do have an extent you have a range that can only go so far but I, I don't think I've ever run out of my five gigahertz Wi-Fi range typically two seconds after I have, I have an exposure and I'm dealing with a 47 megapixel camera I have an image on my on my screen Yes, I, I think CamRanger is, is a really good tool. I use it for my architectural work all the time. Uh, and I have the CamRanger 1. So, you know, that's a really good, uh, good tool to have. I don't know what the difference is between uh, the first and second edition. It's, I know it's a different shape. but uh, uh, Yeah, I think they've improved the range. They've improved the connectivity and a few more features in the software. Could be, could be. Yeah. But I mean... You know how if it's working for you, that's yep. that's the main thing, and it, it's it's an amazing tool. Yes. Um, of course, whenever you're doing anything steel or aluminum, you're going to have reflections, and um, your the the angle of incidence equals the angle of refraction. Um, you're you're basically throwing balls against walls, and uh, the camera is going to if you. If you bounce it off the light off this off the material that's going to come back to the camera, you're going to get some harsh specular lights. So, uh, so you're constantly playing with with angles and with distances. And how do I light this certain area that gives me the uh, the quality of light that I want on the light source, but doesn't uh, blow out uh, a specular highlight? The, the, tr the proof is in the details. You, you definitely typically want to make sure everything is lit. If you decide not to use something, that's fine. Uh, but the last thing you want to do is wish that you had some exposures of a certain aspect of the subject. And then when you're on the computer, you realize you don't have it. So it's always better to light everything. Do anything that you think might, you might use. And if you decide that you're not going to use it uh, when, during the build process, that's fine. That's that's no big deal. I do that all the time. Um, 
one of the, I didn't do it in this particular case. One of the things that I do for, for cars uh, and semis is uh, I have an atmospheric spray fog that I spray in the air that gives light beams um, from the headlights. And it can look really, really cool with the right vehicle. So I'll typically always do it. Um, I didn't know that in, in when I actually uh, photographed this bike. I haven't discovered, discovered that yet. So I, I'll always do it. If I use it or not in the final build, that's a different story. Um, you know, making sure you get the badging. That's always, always important. So little bit by little bit. Uh, now here, this particular light, I probably didn't click balance it yet. Um, uh, I might have just pulled this out. But like I said, I've made uh, Lightroom presets that click balance my uh, all my lighting back to neutral. Now this particular light uh, is is alkaline battery operated. And you'll notice that with those type of lights, uh, with with a type of uh, power sources, they 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 will shift in color uh, and intensity as the battery gets weaker. Uh, I found that rechargeable light sources they will typically give you everything that that they can up until they die, and and then they die. Uh, but there's there's just some case. Per, this is a good example of the overall exposure with the light wand. Um, uh, it's getting a little bit hot in this section of the tank, uh, but then again, I might not. You br you build these images in in Photoshop, and you brush in little by little of every aspect. So how much you, you bring back of an area is totally up to you. So some areas are light, some areas are darker, some areas you particularly uh, create a light mood in just the way you work the image in Photoshop that, that wasn't there the way you photographed it. Uh, a good example is I did a 1949 Willys Jeep. Um, Sorry, a 1940 Willys Jeep, which was the predecessor to the Jeeps that you know now. And uh, the owner wanted to, uh, um, he, he printed out a photograph of Where's Waldo, and he wanted it hidden somewhere in the photograph, because I, I photographed inside his garage. He had neon lights and a bunch of tools and, and an old Michelin sign. So I, I had uh, put it in an area that um, it, it almost was in the center of the photograph, to be perfectly honest with you. But the amount of light that I brought back on that, that printout was just enough that if you were looking for it, you'd see it. But if you were just scanning the photograph, you wouldn't know. He just wanted to have, a, have, a, have some fun with his friends and, uh, and ask him to find Waldo. Um, now, in... This is a situation where I was using my uh, thousand LED light panel to light the background girders. And little by little, I wanted to make sure that I had exposure on, on the ground as well as all the girders. Uh, and even that back wall, I believe I did an exposure a little bit on that back wall. Um, okay, so... I have this streak across here, but I really wasn't concerned about this. This was really for the, uh, the girders under the bridge. Uh, so there are times that you will do things that you know that, um, okay, this, this section of it is not going to look good because I'll have a light leak. But th for this image, the upper part of it is all I'm looking for. Um, you know, again... I'm seeing my light sources here, but I'm getting some light on, on the, the background wall, the girders, some detail here, some cement here. And typically I'll also photograph the owner of the vehicle, uh, but I'll do that with, with strobes. Uh, in this case, I'm, um, I'm only using uh, two strobes. Uh, I use, this is a Godox, uh, 
8600 uh, 8, battery operated strobe with a uh, uh, with an octobox lighting him and then I had an 8200 um, on a stand as a kicker separation light most of the time now I actually use two separation lights on both sides at this particular time I was only using one and then of course vehicle lights I'll always do an exposure for the vehicle lights uh, the way this unfortunate uh, the way this brake light was even though I see the edge of the, the red brake light that's a solid opaque uh, plastic piece of red uh, you don't see any uh, glow from the brake light coming out sideways. Uh, and in this case, just the way the angle of the bike was, uh, it would have taken an extremely long exposure for me to try to get any uh, uh, red source on the, on the ground, and I chose not to. So I wasn't really concerned the fact that I happened to have um, some... I put my lighting here. Now, this was a mistake. I happened to just have my, tr my trigger on my camera on. Uh, so it did, this kicker light did fire a flash, but I was really doing the exposure only for the headlight um, and this little red light on the uh, left handlebar. So again, attention to detail. Uh, every little piece, if it's going to show up, I want to make sure that it's lit uh, or if it's its own light source, I'm going to use it. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, just the street light in the background, every time I did a longer exposure, specifically at F22, it's at such a small aperture, it's giving me this starburst. So I actually, in the final image, I, I artworked this, um, uh, this light out. But going to the build, like I said, you start off with, with the, uh, the base image, and then you start everything's with layer masks everything's coming in and little by little bit you're you're bringing each piece in and you're painting in what you feel is proper how much should something be be brought back in um and because all of these are on their own layers you can come back later and say you know what I, I didn't do I didn't make this area bright enough, or I made this too bright, or you know what? I I got uh, a poor reflection here. Maybe l see if I I can use. Uh, let me erase this area, uh, or mask it out, and use another image to do it. Or, um, which sometimes happens, specifically with specular highlights in Chrome, you just have to uh, do finished artwork in the end. Uh, to to take out the spots chrome will if there's any lights no matter how far away they are street lights uh, uh, car lights uh, window lights whatever um, if you're doing a chrome bumper say anything like the heavy chrome bumpers from the the 30s 40s 50s um, uh, even up to the 70s you will find um, a reflection no matter how how faint the light source is and how far it is away. So as I go through this uh, the build process, each one of these added uh, aspects of the bike is on a separate layer. So here's a good example. Like uh, I, I with this particular exposure, I use this. I brought back in this section of the bike, but I wanted. I wanted more so another exposure I brought back in a little bit more detail here and this is going to seem very finicky but this is what light painting is uh, if you want to do it well um, uh, always doing uh, uh, just if you're familiar with studio lights or um, lighting in general you have to think the same way um, I use kicker lights. I will go go behind the the subject, and I will do uh, an exposure with my light source aimed back at the camera to give specular highlights uh, on on the the edge of of the uh, the subject because you just want to do you want to make it as three dimensional as realistic as possible. And again, sometimes you'll you'll bring in those specular highlights and that that uh, 
those highlights at 100%. Sometimes you'll bring them in at 30%. Uh, you start off with a smaller, smaller brush and a, a lower opacity and a lower flow rate. And then start building it up little bit by little bit. This is this is so interesting. It's it's like you got to know the science really well, and the rest is an art. It's totally a blend of both. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, when you're dealing with uh, light intensities and inverse square law, um, and uh, your angles as well as overall lighting, I mean, this it certainly helps if you have a solid foundation in lighting to begin with. Uh, yes. You know, then you even though you're using different styles of light sources, mm -hmm. you you can still um, translate that into this type of work. And I think if you start doing this kind of work, even if you don't have a solid foundation, you will learn pretty quickly. Um, it you you could, um, mm -hmm. but my only concern is. Um, you might not understand what you're doing wrong that gives you results the way you do. Absolutely. If you're getting something and you say, you know what, this doesn't look right, mm -hmm. but I don't know why. Uh, um, that's why, you know, some going to somebody who, who does have some, some lighting knowledge and skill. A mentor. A mentor, exactly, can, can certainly help you. Um, I, here's a perfect example like just just little this little section here um just bringing in a little bit you have no idea how sometimes it's so minuscule that you're going to bring in from an image uh from one of the exposures but it makes a difference um uh the, you're, these won't be psds they'll be psbs um which gives which allows you to have the i think there's a two gig limit on psds in photoshop document uh, files I, I mean there's several variations of these files that i end up saving um uh, I, I definitely try to keep the uh the layered psb as um as as sort of the the, the golden standard and, and not flatten it and just use work with uh, um, copies of it. One thing I think I wanted to ask you, what lens did you use here? Um, I, I used a 24 to 70, um, uh, I, I used Nikon. So oh. it was a 24 to 70 that I used and I'm just mm -hmm. trying to see if, um, uh, I'm, I'm looking off the JPEG so I don't have the, the metadata which tells me exactly what, uh, um, Focal like length I used at this closer case. Closer to 24, uh, it seemed like it. It would have mm. been, I, I think it would have tried to do it. Um, it probably was closer to 24, but uh, but long enough that it didn't distort the bike. Yes. And plus um, you placed the bike in the middle, in the center. Yeah. So, And um, in you'll see the converging lines on the, on the, on the sides, which... Uh, I straightened that out in in the final image. The final two were here. You know, this this was basically the the exposure. It's possible that my final competition image uh, or images, because I one went to the went to PPA, one went to um, ASP, and one went to um, PPLC. Uh, I, I I might have did some variations of uh, cropping. Mm -hmm. But um, basically, this was the, the, the finished piece. It's beautiful. Now, were you alone or did you have an assistant? Uh, I, I was doing everything alone. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the bike owner was there um, mm -hmm. doing these long of sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always good to have an assistant with you. I, I would always uh, encourage that the owner of the vehicle is there, uh, especially if you're trying to sell them a piece. Um, people do not realize uh, if, uh, unless you're a photographer that has some experience with this, uh, the general public has no clue on, on what can go into something like this. 
Um, there's you do have some slush time to begin with that uh, you arrive ahead of time, and then it takes a little while to get the vehicle in place, and and then do your base exposures, um, uh, and, and then any sky exposures. But then you're twiddling your thumbs until it gets dark. Yeah. Um, and in the city, it, it you have so much ambient light that it's a little bit uh, longer. Uh, my rule of thumb is, uh, again, I'm shooting at ISO, ISO 64, uh, typically F22. I, I wait and do tests, and when I can do a 20-second exposure and basically nothing of the vehicle is lit, that's my start time. That's when I start working. Hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now, uh... Do you, I know you, you mentioned uh, that you did mentor people. Do you actually teach this one-on-one -on -one or in um, the group sessions? And how can people reach you, take advantage of that? Uh, as far as light painting goes, I, mm -hmm. I will be off, offering um, uh, in-person programs for it. But mm -hmm. I, I don't believe I'm going to do it this year. I okay. might start considering it next year. Um, this is really something that uh, is best uh, realized in person. Um, it's one thing to, for me to explain the process and, and, and uh, sh sort of explain what I did through what you've seen here. It's another thing to experience the whole process. Um, and like I said, it, it's very different. Um, but I, I, do, I do mentor people. I do... Uh, um, image critiquing. I help people. I help people around the world uh, become better photographers through my through using Zoom and, and Google Meet. Um, my website impactphotographicdesign.com uh, or a secondary uh, domain name Art in the Dark will take you directly to my light uh, Art in the Dark .ca, I should say will take you directly to my uh, light painting page. But if you look at uh, the sections under photographers, it'll mention some of the things that, I, that I've helped other people out with, uh, you know, my rates and, and things along those lines. And, you know, if you want to uh, sign up for my newsletter, um, it, it's basically designed for um, people of, with owners of vehicles. But I, I might announce um, some in-person courses in Winnipeg uh, that I might be doing next year. Uh, through that newsletter as well. Excellent. I'll also put all the uh, links in the show notes. Perfect. And um, uh, the last question, what would you advise a, a young or or even not so young uh, photographer who's aspiring to create images like this or venture into light painting? Okay. Um, the first thing I would do is I would start uh, start small. Um, you probably already have. I would start with one light source. Um, let's not complicate things with uh, having to balance light sources. But you probably have a flashlight uh, around your your home uh, or an LED panel, or if you you might have something like that. If you're a photographer, uh, I would just start experimenting with. Um, with some with some subjects even inside your home a tabletop subject um, it's it's really best if you have a remote control for your camera so you don't touch it um, and if you're doing anything on a table uh, make sure you don't bump the table but uh, just start playing start getting used to the concept and seeing what the light does um, as we said earlier you sort of have to find your exposure through trial and error uh, per light source and, and how far away you have it from the camera and whatnot. But if you start playing with simple uh, one light sources on a, um, a still still life subject, you, you start getting a feeling for the whole process. Um, and if it's something that, that interests you, um, you can then start um, investing in other equipment. But there's no sense in investing in equipment if you're not this is not something you like or you're fascinated by. The one thing I'll say is these images are impossible to get any other way. They give you a finished look 
that no other lighting technique can give you. Uh, and that's what I fell in love with and was so fascinated with. Um, and I mean, like I said, this was the first motorcycle I ever did. And it did extremely well for me in competition. But I see things that I, would, I, can, I know I would do differently and better uh, if I was photographing this bike today. And I think this image, if you were to flip a magazine and come across it, there's no way you're not going to stop you're going to stop and be pulled into this image. It's, it's so striking. And I think uh, light painting, um, well, well uh, done, does that for you. It, well, that's, like I said, that's what got me into it. Um, yeah, yeah. I started seeing some work by uh, a particular photographer and my jaw dropped. And I've been in the industry for 32, 34 years. And I've seen some amazing work. Um, but I saw what this guy was able to produce mm -hmm. and I thought my work was junk and, um, <laughs> uh, like I've, I've, I got tons of decorations, tons of awards, tons of accolades and stuff, but I just felt humbled, uh, by what this person was able to produce. It's like, okay, I have to find a way to learn that and, uh, and add that skill set. And that's what photography is all about. Adding Absolutely. more and more skill sets. True. Well, thank you so much, Bruce, for your time. Uh, this was so enlightening, and uh, you 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 went through the presentation so well. I didn't didn't even feel like interrupting you with too many questions. But thank you so much for well, thank, su such ahead. a such a beautiful presentation. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I have a tendency of talking a lot. Hopefully, I uh, did answer all your questions. Yes. Um, somewhere in all my uh, jabbering. But um, thank you for having me, and uh, hopefully uh, I'll be back. Absolutely. If you like this presentation, click on the like button, and don't forget to subscribe.